okay uh, so let's begin in the last class we uh, looked at the poles and zeros in the uh, differential amplifier right and uh, before that let me actually draw that once So let me clarify a few things. So, I mean, let us say I call the inputs to be v1 and v2, right? So if the uh, so this node voltage is Vx, so when is Vx the average of the two? Under what conditions this is valid? One we saw as uh, the R naught of the n mos must go to infinity. Yeah, and uh, the tail node impedance again. I'm just this is this node is called the tail node tail node impedance must also be infinity okay only under these two conditions you can say this is the average of the two but uh, we also saw if i were to apply a differential excitation like this then uh, vx will be zero and for this what is the condition that is needed to be satisfied No, that is for the first case, right? I can say, I mean, uh, Vx is average of the two if these two are satisfied. So, if I were to apply differential excitation, what is the minimum condition I need to guarantee to have uh, the tail node to be zero? Again, if I satisfy these two, obviously this will be zero. But do I have to satisfy both of them or? Huh? Only the tail node? Are you sure? Are you sure? Huh? Why not this? Hmm? What? I mean, so let us say I have only R naught to be infinity. Okay, then what do I say? I mean, uh, I am saying that the R naught of the n mos transistors is infinity. So in that case, uh, what is the impedance looking into the source? One by gm. Okay. What about the impedance looking here? Huh? R naught of the transistors is infinity for both. Okay. This is also one by gm. Okay. Please remember uh, the impedance looking into the source depends actually on the impedance you have at the drain. But we under what condition you can approximate as 1 by gm? Drain resistance is much smaller than the R0 of the transistor. In this case, R0 is infinity. So, any finite impedance you put here that is going to be smaller than the R0 of the transistor. So, the looking in impedance is 1 by gm. Okay, so uh, from this node you see that I seem to have two identical impedances connected. So at least at this node, the circuit seems to be symmetric, right? So again, uh, recollect earlier we saw that if we have a linear network, two identical networks, if you apply anti-symmetric excitation, the nodes at the point of symmetry will be zero. Okay, and this is what is happening here. So, we, I have applied anti symmetric excitation. At this node, I seem to have a symmetrical network. So, this is the point of symmetry. So, this node will be 0. Okay. So, for uh, this condition, only this needs to be satisfied. And even if we have something here, whatever, it does not matter. This will be at 0. Okay. Right. And uh, so this node we saw will be a 0. And how many poles and zeros does it have? 
in the differential mode how many poles and zeros we calculated we had one capacitor here we had C L and C1 how many poles two poles and how many zero one zero so what was the pole associated with this capacitor it is the conductance at that node which is the output uh, conductance by the capacitance what about this the impedance here is 1 over gm and capacitance is c so what is the pole minus gm of the pmos by c1 and similarly we also found the zero location you remember what was the zero location it was basically two times the right again uh, this was called the dominant pole okay great and also i also look, uh, mentioned about this right uh, yeah so if this tail node is not grounded i mean basically what i am getting at is here the tail node is grounded so the impedance looking was just 1 by gm okay because this was at ground but this this was not at ground like you have in a regular case where is it like this where this is not at ground then again as we saw the impedance here was what it's written already it's 1 by 2 times gm okay that's basically because you will also have current actually flowing from the right branch to the left branch adding to the total conductance okay so again this is a, this is a simple looking circuit with only 5 transistors but because of the fact that you have put in this diode connection you introduce asymmetry and uh, all your intuitions might initially be wrong so you should be careful when you actually look in and try to say anything about the circuit okay and that is why i gave one of the problems to calculate each of the node impedances in the first practice set so please work it out and uh, you know make sure you are familiar with this right and of course first you, you might not be able to say everything by inspection so work out by uh, applying kcl kvl and work out the relation and then see how you can actually get that result by inspection like how i am doing in the class okay so that's how you develop that uh, practice okay so okay then let's get back to the business so this is it so which means if i plot the frequency response so first i'll have one dominant pole and then i'll have the non dominant pole under zero like this right so basically you see that for all pract i mean uh, for all practical purpose i can approximate as a first order system right because the second pole and all the other zeros actually come at much higher frequencies that even if i approximate as a first order uh, characteristic like this the error you make might be very small okay so whenever you have a dominant pole in your system reasonably you can approximate as a first order system like this Great. So now we have done the uh, defamp. So what is the next? What was the next amplifier we looked at? The cascode, right? So first, let's look at the uh, normal cascode. Okay. So assume uh, for now I have an ideal current source at the top. again i'll only consider capacitors from each node to ground okay so let's say this is cl and uh, this is c1 say this is n1 and this is m2 okay so this is incrementally short v in is here we have to see okay so now how many poles and zeros do you think this has
how many poles huh? two, two poles two. right because i can basically set the initial voltages on both the capacitors independently without any contradiction so this has two poles how many zeros why okay if i short c1 this node is zero right gate is also zero source is also zero so what will be the current flowing in the transistor zero isn't it so what will be the output then no man see this is ground right oops i think i'm stuck just a second it's got stuck Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, this node is zero, gate is zero. What is the incremental current that will flow in the transistor? Zero. zero. So then, what will be the output voltage then? If zero current flows in the transistor, that will also be a zero, isn't it? If only if we apply a gate to source voltage, the transistor is going to respond with some incremental current, and that current will flow into the drain resistance to generate the output voltage. Okay, so here uh, both the gate and source are at zero. Okay, so what will be the output then? Zero. So how many zeros does it have? Zero zero. So it has no zeros. Is that okay? So now we just need to find the pole locations. So I will not consider the input and output for that. It's a matter. Okay. So now, uh, do you think these two capacitors are coupled or uncoupled? That is, is there some connection between these two capacitors that will allow current to flow? What is it? We have R naught of the transistor coupling the two, right? Okay. So, uh, but as I was saying in the last class, if you have a cascade of two RC sections like this. It turns out if uh, <coughs> one of the time constants is much much larger than the other, the pole locations can still be approximated as minus one by R one and minus one by R two C. Okay, and the simplistic explanation is that. We know that if you put a buffer, the pole locations are this. The act of putting a buffer, what it does is, it makes sure that looking in impedance is very large, so that this guy is not loading this. I can also kind of ensure it by having R2 to be larger, roughly speaking. Okay. So again, you can work out, you can work out the transfer <coughs> function for this. So you work out the transfer function for this, and then you will find uh, in the denominator you will find a quadratic equation because it has two poles. If you make the assumption again that one of the poles is much much larger than the other, which basically translates to this. Okay, then you will find approximate pole locations are again this. Okay, so we'll try to do something similar here. Let me push it up maybe. So I'll assume that one of the poles here is much much larger than the other. Okay. So in that case, I can say I have uncoupled poles. Right. So then I can directly find the pole location as the conductance at that node by the capacitance at that node. And then we'll see if the assumption actually is it valid or not. Okay, so let's try to write this, and then see if it is in turn valid or not. Okay, because if you include the coupling, then it's going to be messy, right? You'll have to again sit and calculate, find the transfer function, 
solve the quadratic but we'll take the simplistic route and see if it's fine or not okay so we'll assume that there is no coupling between these two caps for now so what is the pole associated with this node the capacitance is cl what is the resistance what is it r not ah it is the cascode impedance it is gm1 sorry it should come in the denominator uh, let me gm1 times cl okay so now let's look at the second pole again the capacitance is c1 ah oh, sorry yeah minus thanks so this is c1 what about the looking up huh? okay but when is it 1 by gm again right but this is no no this is a current source right in incremental this is going to be open okay and remember if you have a finite drain resistance what is the let me write it here ah if i add something like this here what is the drain uh, total impedance connected to the drain there is no rd right current source is not there is there something else connected to the drain please look carefully and the capacitor is there so i mean this this is what rd for us isn't it so here what is the impedance looking up looking uh, here by 1 plus oops 1 plus gmrd i'll approximate as gmrd gmr not okay that's okay so we'll try to do something similar say i call the impedance here as z1 so what is z1 same thing right can you tell me what is z1 hmm R not plus one by S C L. Is that okay? Same thing. Uh, the R not of the transistor plus the impedance connected at the drain. Here, the only impedance connected at the drain is the capacitor. That's all. So now, uh, when can I approximate as one by G M one? If R not is here. Okay. So basically, what this means is, if I am looking at a frequency wherein this capacitor <coughs> offers a much lower impedance than the R not of the transistor, then the looking up impedance is still one by gm approximately. Is that okay? so what will happen is this right so if you are uh, looking at a high frequency supposedly high frequency this capacitor will behave like a short circuit right then what is the looking in impedance it's 1 by gm that's what we have also obtained okay and it turns out that's what will happen because uh, here we know that the output resistance is going to be very large you will also have some load capacitance so this pole will be at a low frequency or a high high frequency it will be at a much lower frequency in fact this will be the dominant pole right so what will happen is if you try to again plot the frequency response it will start to drop immediately so by the time you encounter the second pole here the capacitor would have offered a much lower impedance and that would have pulled this uh, output voltage to a low impedance so in that case i can approximate the looking up impedance as 1 by gm okay so now can you tell me what is the pole location minus gm1 by cl c1 okay. so here i assume that uh, by the time P2 is encountered. 
1 by SEL is actually much much smaller than R0. Okay. It's a reasonable approximation because here what I say is S is much much greater than 1 by R0 CL. Right? But when I encounter the first pole, S is much much greater than this entire term, right? R01 times GM R0 CL also. No, no, you'll never have a microfarad scale first. So, yeah, at max picofarad or hundreds of m to farad, tens of m to farad. I mean, these capacitors are all parastic, I mean, intrinsic capacitances of the transistor. Mm -hmm. They'll be order of few femto farads maximum. So, is that fine? So, the first pole you have will be at this. Second pole is minus gm by c1. Okay. So, again, uh, this has only one dominant pole and the other is the non-dominant pole. So now uh, with this we will look at the telescopic as code. Let me quickly draw that. Oops. So again, if I apply a differential input here and make suitable approximation, I can say that the common source node is also at ground. Okay. So this is the connection we have. This is the output. So again, I'll consider uh, capacitors from each node to ground. So let me quickly mark it, CL, okay. So how many poles do you think we'll have? Six poles, six capacitors and each capacitor is, can be set independently, no problem. So we'll have six poles, and uh, remember this is the output. Okay, how many zeros we'll have? First, can we will will we have at least one zero? We can have one zero, right? Because I can short this capacitor, or it will still be fine. Can we have two zeros? Huh? Which two capacitors I can short? Uh, Which one? Bottom. This one. Hmm. Okay, and then to have two capacitors, I need to be able to short two of them to ground and still get a finite output. Then, this one? Hmm. This one and which one? Opposite. Opposite. Will that work? If I short these two, all the current will basically flow here, right? See, these are the transistors which generate the incremental current. If I short their trains, all the current will flow into the short circuit and nothing will go to the output. So output will be zero in this case. So is there some other capacitor I can short along with the... <coughs> See, simplest thing is, I have now uh, basically two branches, two halves, right? Output is taken from one half. So, crudely speaking, I can do anything to this branch and still get a non zero output. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? So, I can basically short these two capacitors to ground. Still, it's fine. I will not have anything from this, but this will generate current and give me output. So, can I short three capacitors then? Same, right? I can short all three capacitors in the left branch. That will just make the left side branch completely inactive and that's okay because I will get the current from the right side branch. So can I short uh, one more capacitor? So of course we know these two, these three can be done. 
is there something else can be huh? no ah this also i can short isn't it no but from here it is going to here right this is this is short which means this is going to have a some impedance that's all is it fine basically i can short all these so left side branch is gone from this branch you will have current flowing here and the output impedance is parallel of this that's all but i can't short one more capacitor because now you are left either with this or this and if you short either of them output is zero so how many poles so how many zeros four zeros okay so four capacitors you can short this three on left and one on uh, oops top p mos okay great so again we'll uh, make the same assumption uh, with respect to the pole location oops i should have been careful I can't do anything on this part. Okay, four zeros. Okay, so uh, again, for calculating the poles, we'll make an assumption that there is no coupling among each of the capacitors. Okay, because the moment I include coupling, it's again going to be really messy. so we'll assume that we have uncoupled poles okay and then we'll say that the pole associated with the i node is basically the conductance at that node by the capacitance at that node this is something very common we'll do when we estimate uh, pole locations because this is the only way in which we can at least qualitatively guess what the pole location is right and of course uh, this is only valid if uh, there is each of the pole is actually much much greater than the other okay else is not be valid right so uh, can you say uh, anything about the do dominant pole which will be the dominant pole that is which capacitor here will contribute to the dominant pole cl right because dominant pole is basically the lowest frequency pole so i should have the basically the smallest conductance and a large enough capacitance and the smallest conductance meaning the largest output resistance is the output resistance looking in okay so uh, the dominant pole will be associated with the capacitor cl and that's basically the output conductance by the capacitance and this is the conductance of the cascode you guys know it's uh, cascode impedance up parallel to the cascode impedance down that's it okay. again similarly you can try to find out what the other uh, pole locations are by finding the impedances looking up each node but i mean uh, it's not it's not relevant because i know that i'll going to have only one dominant pole and all the other poles i'll assume comes later so i'll say that roughly speaking the frequency response is going to look like this and all the other poles and zeros will come later so i'll approximate it again as that's all okay so ah uh, yeah again the point is now we'll assume that yeah that's a good question he is saying that if you look at the impedance here it won't be a simple cascode because you also have all these capacitors here so any explanation for that basically he is saying i cannot write it like this right so any response to that it has the impedances very small but yeah that is problematic right no no if it's small you can't take like them 
see dominant pole is the lowest frequency pole right so we are looking at a much much lower frequency so what can you say about the capacitor impedances that will be very large okay so since we are looking at the dominant pole we are looking at within quotes a low frequency calculation so those frequencies all other caps will provide a large enough impedance and we can ignore them i mean this will again be valid if there are only uh, parasitic capacitors if you intentionally go and put a large capacitor at some node this will not be valid okay by design you will have it like this but intentionally you can go and sabotage by putting a large capacitor at some node then this will not work that fine great so now all the otas or the amplifiers we have seen can be modeled like this right which ha it has one dominant pole so i can approximate it as a first order system like this okay and the dominant pole is uh, associated with the output nodes so it will have some g not here some cl here and the dominant pole was basically minus g not by cl okay great and uh, i mean all these stuff we are looking are single stage ots and uh, remember uh, why do we want a very high gain from the ota in the first class we are discussing right ideally i want an infinite gain but infinite gain is literally useless to me because i apply some finite here it will blow up so what is the point of having an infinite gain we use it in negative feedback right so finally this ota whatever we design will be put in some negative feedback like this some impedances here some impedances here like this so it and the moment i put uh, things in negative feedback what is the potential problem sorry fundamentally gain huh? no not you know this thing something very fundamentally again stability. stability is the main problem okay whenever you put in negative feedback see gain reducing is okay i can still use the system swings at least i can reduce swings and make it work but if it's unstable i can't use it at all okay and uh, this is if you use a single stage ota here so i we see we saw that we can approximate as a first order system so then do you think it will be unstable or stable huh? it's a first order system if i put it in negative feedback can it become unstable or can it be stable may be unstable so when, when can you say if the system is stable or unstable just a try you know like you just face margin and face margin and stuff are all proxies but what is the faults of the system after putting in negative feedback the closed loop system must have all poles in the left half of s plane okay so this is the transfer function okay probably i'll have to write it again so the transfer function i have is this right so if i put it in a closed loop say something like this what is the closed loop transfer function what is v not by vi if this is a of s by fine so can you simplify and tell me what this is equal to ha huh. yes by p1 so can you tell me if it's in uh, if the pole is in right of plane or left of plane 
A naught is, I mean, it's a large gain, it's a positive number. It's a left half plane. Okay. So this is, I mean, so if you take any first order system, can this actually can this become unstable? Everything here is positive. I mean, your question is A naught can be negative, but we can actually, that's why you have the sign here, right? You have to choose it properly. So that this guy turns out to be positive. So everything in the denominator is positive. So pole is definitely in left half of S plane. Okay. And that's why, oops. So that's why first order systems are always stable. Great. So yeah, now we know this. We have the single stage OTA. I am saying we can approximate as a first order system. So can this become unstable? No, right? So single stage OTA, the uh, nice thing is, it is always stable. I mean, I just put it in quotes because this is just an approximation. If you don't do it properly, you might have more poles and this can become unstable. But most of the time, you will always find it to be stable because you will have only one dominant pole. You can treat it like a first order system more or less. Great. But uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, so this is very good for uh, driving capacitive loads. But if you want to connect a resistive load, what might happen is see uh, this single stage OTA could be your normal 5 transistor op amp or your folded cascode or telescopic cascode, gain boosted cascode, whatever. You would have done all these techniques. Why did you do all these techniques, cascoding, gain boosting, and all? What was the point of it? Increase again. In particular, what did we increase? R out. So, you would have done all the techniques and made the R out to be say some 10 mega ohms or something. Now, you are putting 1 kilo ohms of load in parallel and gain goes for a toss. Okay. So, that is a problem. You can't drive resistive loads. Okay. Oh. Right. So, this is nice, but this is bad. No? Great. So, let us see what we can do. Uh, we all, I mean, now we know we can make a, a very good single stage OTA with a large gain, but I want to drive a small resistive load and we cannot connect it directly. What can we do? Okay, so let us say put a buffer. So, how will you realize this buffer finally? Common? Common drain, right? And remember, common drain uh, can give a gain of 1 only in an ideal case where you have a current source here. But the moment you again put this load resistor here, the gain will drop probably you can get 0 0.5, 0 0.6 or something like that. Okay. So, this again is not a great thing, right? Because now you say you got a gain of 1000 here. You seem to be losing half the gain. This let us say it is 0 0.5, right? So, you seem to be losing something. So, is there something uh, better you can do? I mean, he, his suggestion is valid. We cannot connect these two together. We need to put something in between. But what I am saying is, if you put a buffer, you will going to take, you will take a hit in the gain, overall gain. So can you do, can you put something else here so that your gain is also higher? Huh? Yeah, okay, op amp or basically you can actually put one more GM stage here, isn't it? Okay. 
again see with uh, this load here this cannot get a high gain but let's say even if it gets a gain of 10 which is reasonable enough the overall gain is 10 power 4 so that way you don't basically take a hit in the overall gain you are in fact increasing the overall gain right so here uh, the first stage you see it takes a differential input and takes a provides a single ended output so again the possible choices are the 5 transistor OTA CAS code again folded or telescopic So uh, what about the second stage? The second stage takes in just one input and gives one output. What is the simplest choice? Huh? Sorry? Common source, right? I mean, I just need to take one input and amplify and provide. Single input, single output, common source is the simplest choice. So you can put a common source stage here. Okay, so basically you see the bulk of the gain is provided by the first stage. So this is the gain and the second stage is there to provide some additional gain and to be able to drive the resistive load you have. And now uh, let's say you find that uh, this gain is not enough for you. You want say uh, one more, I mean you want a gain of 10 power 5. What can you do now? Huh? You can put another stage, right? I mean, so let's say I can get only a gain of 1000 with this guy and a gain of, uh, oops. A gain of 10 with uh, one common source stage. I can get a gain of 10 with one more common source stage and then increase again. And this basically gives rise to the multi stage uh, OT. Now of course it will have its own problems. The main problem is I know that uh, if I take each individual GM, it is a dominant pole system, I can approximate it as a first order system and the dominant pole is at the output, right. But now I am putting uh, multiple such stages in cascade and each will have its own dominant pole. So now you no longer overall you no longer have just a first order system right because each stage has its own dominant pole here. So overall you can have multiple poles and this can actually become unstable. Okay. So what we'll do is uh, we'll try to understand stability <coughs> negative feedback loops. Okay. So again, uh, the same structure. The office. See the feedback is some uh, beta. Yeah, something like this. So, what to see? Closed loop transfer function. Great. 
so what is the loop gain in this huh? afs into beta everyone is fine with that how do you find the loop gain Ah, I mean, first you have to make the input zero, and then you basically break the loop at some point. So inject something, some test signal, and see what comes around. So if this is a of s, what will come here? Uh, look carefully. Is there something missing? Minus, Minus beta a of s. Okay. So negative of what comes this is the loop gain. So I'll denote it as L g of s. That is beta times a of s. Okay. So uh, the transfer function I can basically write it like this: one by beta times loop gain by one plus loop gain. Okay. So now, uh, let's say A of S is our first order system. So, uh, what is H of S? We already calculated. A naught by one plus A naught. I mean, you already calculated this. Okay. So, what is the closed loop pole? What is the pole location? Oops, actually, okay, uh, actually, is something is missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beta, right? Yeah, beta comes here, I guess. Okay. So, what is the closed loop pole? Sorry, minus yeah, a naught beta plus one times p one. Okay. I mean, I'll, I can also approximate as minus a. right? I know a naught beta is going to be a much much larger number, so I'll ignore the one. So, what is the uh, closed loop bandwidth? Closed loop 3 dB bandwidth. It's the same thing, same. right? I mean, that's it. I'll just write it with a plus sign. That's all. Okay. So now, uh, let's say I take the loop gain function. Loop gain is basically beta times a of s, which is this guy. Okay, so if I try to sketch the loop gain, not in of it. What is it at low frequencies? It is beta a naught, and then what will happen when it encounters the pole? It will drop like this. And let's say this is the uh, zero dB line. Okay, I'll call uh, this as omega u, where uh, omega u is called the unity gain frequency or unity loop gain frequency, or very commonly it's also referred to as uh, unity gain bandwidth. Or UGB. It's basically the frequency at which the magnitude of the loop gain becomes equal to one. So in this case, what is omega u? Yeah. How did you say that? Huh? Sorry, sorry. Ah. Huh. So the idea is at this point. I mean, in this range of frequencies, I can basically neglect one, 
with respect to the second term because this is at a i mean we are looking at a large frequency that i can ignore uh, this one so if i ignore one so this is basically beta a not is by p1 so i want it to equal to 1 and uh, this what you get is it okay so if you remember this was the same as our closed loop bandwidth right so this is also equal to uh, the closed loop 3db bandwidth okay again this is true for a first order system so one last remark again uh, this unit eigen frequency is basically beta times a not what is a not it's a dc gain times what is p1 it's a pole or basically the dominant pole in our system okay so we can find the uh, if you have a first order system like this or supposedly looking like a first order system like what we have in our amplifiers the unity loop gain frequency you can find directly by multiplying the feedback factor the dc gain and the dominant pole and that's also equal to the closed loop 3 db bandwidth okay so uh, we'll stop here and uh, we'll continue